if you just look at the density of the cloud, which is probability density of finding electron. And you're right, you don't see the electron, you see the probability of finding electron there. But what we've known for 40 years now is that if you look at the Laplacian, which is just the second derivative in three dimensions of this charged cloud, you just imagine a line going through the cloud and the three orthogonal directions, X, Y, and Z directions, if you like. And along each of those directions, then the cloud density has a curvature. It's just the second derivative in that direction. Those are just numbers, positive or negative. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a returning guest, Dr. Preston McDougall. He's a professor of chemistry at Middle Tennessee State University. I think that the, the material that he's been working on is incredibly interesting because I'm not sure if I'm going to put this correctly, but he's visualizing what the, uh, I guess, what the valence electron shells would look like on various molecules, if you were able to look at it with, with the naked eye. So I thought that was a fascinating concept. The concepts in here, I believe, govern likely a lot of chemical interactions or most chemical interactions, and perhaps it's not known by the chemistry community at large. Perhaps it is. But I wanted to get back into his material and see what's new. So Preston, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me, Richard. Always excited to talk about my research. Yeah. Well, if you would tell me about it, you know, for lay people and for people like me that probably are I'm pretty bad at describing it. Tell me what your research is about. All right, very good. Well, you mentioned that my research helps chemists and physicists and molecular biologists see what the electron density looks like at the subatomic level, if we could see it with our naked eyes. So it's interesting you said that, because of course we can't see things that are sub nanometer level with our naked eyes because of the wavelengths of light that our right line is detect. And what chemists and physicists use to probe uh, matter at the atomic level is X-rays, which have wavelengths at the size of, of atoms, angstroms or an angstrom, one angstrom or so. And so we don't see these with our naked eyes, but I was just at a conference in Dallas called the Austin Symposium. It's spoofed to Dallas. It was held in Austin for many for a couple of decades, but it's moved to Dallas. So it's the Austin Symposium on Molecular Structure and Dynamics at Dallas. And one of the plenary speakers talked about his research using laser spectroscopy to probe surfaces that are reactive surfaces that chemists are very interested in when they're in solution. Normally, scientists use tools to probe surfaces when they're in a vacuum because the solvent can interrupt, interfere with many, most of the probes chemists and physicists use. So during his talk, he was talking about if in 20 years we have X-ray vision, this is what hopefully we would like to see, what chemists would like to see. So I, I like to... I'm now using that metaphor that he had. I think it's very good. What I'm going to talk about is what physicists and microbiologists can compute using quantum mechanics about the charge cloud at the atomic level, and it is what they would see if they had X-ray vision. So basically, if um, quick and, quick question yeah. here though, um, because of the you know the wave particle nature of electrons and uh, because of quantum mechanics, I guess you wouldn't really see a surface, but what would you see a, a shimmering surface uh, that kind of undulates or a cloud or what, like, that's what, what, what does it look like? That's what I was just going to get to. You get, you basically see a cloud. 
And the cloud, if you look at just the, the bare cloud, it's kind of pedestrian and boring in appearance. It only has peaks at where the nuclei, and nuclei are very, very small compared to the size of an atom, extremely small. So the peak is very, very sharp at the nucleus, and then it just sort of diffuses out to almost nothing, and then it goes up again when it comes near another nucleus. So it looks very boring if you just look at the density of the cloud, which is probability density of finding electrons. And you're right, you don't see the electron, you see the, the probability of finding electron there. But what we've known for um, 40 years now is that if you look at the Laplacian, which is just the second derivative in three dimensions of this charged cloud, so you, you, you just imagine a line going through the cloud in, in the three orthogonal directions, X, Y, and Z directions, if you like. And along each of those directions, then the cloud density has a curvature. It's just the second derivative in that direction. Those are just numbers, positive or negative. And you add the three together and you get what's called the Laplacian. It's very negative when you have a cusp, like you have at the nucleus, like a pin brick, a pin, needle of a pin. It's very sharp. And the curvature there is minus infinity. And when it's positive, it's when you have a hole, like a, di a dent in the density. So I like to make the analogy to Braille. When a blind person is reading Braille, what they're doing is they're running their fingers across the surface. And when there are dots, there is a raised level. That raised level has like a little mountain peak. That is a negative curvature in the direction that the Braille person is reading and also the perpendicular direction because these dots are circular. Good question here. When, when you consider the active sites of a given molecule, will they tend to look more concave or convex? What kind of surface features would be, a, again, the active sites of a molecule? Let me just explain the, bra the Braille down. So the Braille has a, a lump where there's a dot and there's a little concave pit place between dots where there's no dot. So a Braille person gathers information from a, a sheet of paper from positive and negative regions of curvature. And, and an atom, which is three-dimensional, but concept is the same. As you move your imaginary X-ray vision or X-ray finger around the surface of an atom, if it's a base which has extra electrons that is willing to wanting to donate to other atoms or other molecules, there will be a lump there, and that will have a negative curve in three dimensions in its valence shell, where chemically active electrons might be. Whereas an acid, which is looking to accept electrons from other atoms or molecules, that will have a hole, a positive curvature in its region of its three-dimensional shape. That's what the chemist calls valence shell. An atom is like an onion, which has layers. Some of the inner layers are like pit of, of, of beach. They're things that you don't eat. Poor, those are the cores of atoms. They are not involved in chemical reactions. And then when you get further from the center of the atom, you get out into the valence region where you have electrons that can interact with, with other atoms and molecules. Those are called the valence electrons. And that's, that's where we, we are building the curvature, the, the lumps and the holes, positive curvatures and negative curvatures, and we correspond that those correspond to sites of Korea often, almost always to sites of reactivity for many kinds of chemical reactions. And we can identify oh, them. Okay. I was going to say, we can see, we can visualize them with the software. The most telling and helpful is the software I developed with researchers at NASA Ames Research Center in Moffett Field, California. So you can use this tool to focus in or out on a, a different parts of the features of the atom, subatomic features. Just like if you've ever used a microscope, an optical microscope, to probe cells, you can adjust the focal plane. Different organelles will come into focus. And as you focus on that plane on the cell, the optical plane, and other things about it, we can do the same thing for these atomic and molecular charge distributions to see different regions of the atom as opaque and the other regions become transparent that we're not interested in. And you can see all these wonderful sites of reactivity of atoms and molecules. I just, at a conference I was in in Dallas, I gave a talk, three in one, a bromine atom in a hydrocarbon, substitute a hydrocarbon molecule that rearranges to a more useful form when it's absorbed inside a zeolite, which is like a cave-link molecule with cave-link features all throughout it. This reaction occurs catalytically inside these caves and chemists want to know why. What is it? What happens? So we, we, using this tool, we're able to see these three different interactions with different lumps and holes of the bromine atom interacting with its neighbors that chemists understand why this reaction occurs so easily and beneficially inside these cave zeolite molecules. And just... Yeah, okay, well... Before we continue, 
I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. A couple of quick questions, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, what does a covalent bond versus an ionic bond look like from your purview? Very good. Okay. A covalent bond is when two atoms are sharing one or more of their valence electrons with another atom. And so what happens when you look at the curvature between these two atoms, there's basically a lump between, uh, connecting them. So there's like, a, not, it's not a cylinder, it's not a cylinder, it's not like a bar, it's not like the plastic tubes you see in organic chemistry class. It's kind of tubular kind of feature inside this tubular area, which is not sharply defined, as you already noted. And inside this roughly tubular area, three-dimensional area, the charge density is concentrating. It's, it's a lump there. It's a negative curvature and a re tube connecting these two atoms. And so if you look at images of molecule like vitamin B12, vitamin B12 has lots of covalent bonds in the porphyrin molecule surrounding the cobalt ion and a lot of the organic shrubbery, I like to call it, that's part of the coenzyme. All the carbon and, and nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms in this coenzyme are connected by covalent bonds. So you see all these orange, we use orange to color the negative curvatures. And so you see all these orange tubes all over the place connecting the molecules in the organic part of the molecule, vitamin B12. But at the heart of vitamin B12 is one cobalt plus three ion, which has ionic bonds to the neighboring nitrogen atoms in the porphyrin, which hold it in place and help the cobalt ion do all the chemistry it needs to do in our bodies. Those bonds look very different because they are essentially, essentially ionic bonds. And so if you look at those, if you zoom in on those with our visualization tool, what you see at the nitrogen end of this bond is a big red orange lump because there's a, a pair of electrons there that are not covalently bonded to another atom. It's just like in ammonia, nitrogen has an extra pair of electrons. So ammonia is a basic substance. When you put ammonia in water, the pH uh, goes up is the base. So this, the orange lump, in the on the nitrogen atoms, and there's four of them, and a corin ring, porphyrin, por, uh, so it's a corin ring, it's like a porphyrin ring, uh, but it's a little bit different, a little puckered. And it was just four of these nitrogens with these red orange lumps pointing at the cobalt ion. The cobalt ion has doesn't have in its valence shell, it has these big blue. We use blue and green to represent the positive curvatures where there is a hole in the atom's uh, electron cloud. The, the cobalt ion has four or six, six very beautiful, look, look like blue trumpets. They're coming out from the core of the cobalt ion and going out into the, pointing towards the rest of the, the molecule. And four of those are pointed, four of those blue trumpets are pointed directly at these orange lumps on the nitrogen atoms that hold, that form a covalent bond, I'm sorry, sorry, an ion bond. A lot of chemists think it's covalent, but it, it's it's ionic. It's a cobalt ion connecting to four surrounding nitrogen atoms, which have unshared pairs of electrons that are attracted to the cobalt ion. So in this case, between the two atoms, there's no orange tube because the electrons that are shared or bonding the nitrogen to the cobalt are all basically on the nitrogen atom. They haven't shifted really at all, very much at all, from where they are in the corin ring when there's no cobalt ion. In other words, those four orange lumps on the nitrogen atoms in the corin ring, kind of like a crown that is going to capture the cobalt ion, those four lumps, if you look at them before the cobalt ion is there and after the cobalt ion is there, they haven't changed. What they've done is they've locked in the cobalt ion by lining up the lumps with the holes on the cobalt ion. And it's really quite beautiful. Um, 
Go ahead. I was going to ask you what happens when the two molecules approach. Is there a deformation of the surface features, or is there a, like an instant reorientation so that you know a bump will go near a hole to form the bonding? Like, does this inform how molecules bond? Now that you yes. can see things, sometimes you can watch this happen with with quantum mechanical simulations. You can watch how the cloud electron cloud evolves when two atoms come close. In the case of the covalent bond formation, yes, those clouds, you can see that you can see the clouds deform dramatically. And you can see the tube of charge concentration of shear electrons, you can see it form from spherical atoms that are not bonding or spherical. As they approach, the tube forms, and you see the orange tube form. That's in a covalent bond. But in the ionic bond I was describing, it's more like a key approaching a lock. The key, when it opens a door, the key doesn't deform. It just enters the lock and turns it and opens a door. So there's no deformation of the key or the lock. That's basically what happens with these ionic bonds that are really like donor acceptor interactions. And there's not there's not any true covalency. It is oh. strong bonds. You can get your key stuck in your lock pretty easily and have a hard time getting it out. But they're not true covalent bonds or the things deform as they approach. I have a little um, demonstration that I just thought of illustrate this without video, without any kind of images during a podcast. So one of the instances of this that I saw that struck me, and when I saw it on my computer, I couldn't believe it. This is exactly what you're saying. When you, If you just move rock these two atoms that are forming this kind of ionic bond between a metal and a carbon atom, I would have expected the bonds to deform. But when I, when I rocked them, Again, theoretically, a computational chemist can position the atoms, the nuclei, wherever he or she wants, and use quantum mechanics to calculate what is the optimum distribution cloud for that positioning of the atoms. So we can do this a multitude of times, stimulating chemical reactions and watch how the cloud changes. Now, of course, other people calculate the cloud. They just they don't really look at the cloud the way I do. I look at the lumps and the holes, as, as I mentioned, in the cloud. And this is how you can see these dramatic things occur or not occur. So the example I saw, I was in Texas at the time, struck me, just I couldn't believe my eyes. We were studying a uh, what's called a Schrock carbine. It's a catalyst invented by an MIT chemistry professor and Nobel laureate Richard Schrock. So these Schrock carbines have a formally a double bond. Now chemists will sometimes call them covalent bond between a metal and a carbon. And this carbon can then form polymers uh, very easily. The metal helps this reaction occur very quickly. So you make very high quality polymers with this catalyst. I was studying the double bond, the covalent, supposedly covalent bond between, between the, the niobium and the carbon. Now, actual shock for the chemists that might be listening, the actual shock, shock catalyst has, has a tantalum, but we were using niobium as a model. It's right, niobium's right above tantalum on the periodic table. So anyways, the tantalum has a big, has a hole. Like I mentioned, the cobalt and the vitamin B12. It has a big hole, has several, several holes, but one big one that is opposite the carbon. Carbon has a lump, like the nitrogen on the corms. Now, here's where you can use your hands and your fingers. Take your uh, left hand and with your index finger pointing to the right. So you you're just have your, your elbow out to the left and you're pointing to the right with your index finger. Now take your right hand and put your right hand index finger on top of your left hand index finger. So you should have two overlapping fingers in front, of you, right in front. Of you. Okay, gotcha. And now imagine that your left elbow is locked in position. It's locked into an enzyme. It can't move. Big hunk of a molecule can move, but you can move your right elbow. Now, if you move your right elbow down, your two fingers will are sort of stuck together. They represent the double, the double bond. You can see how the, the two fingers move. That's the way a double bond, covalent bond, would work. There would be bending of the bond as one part of the molecule moves. That's the way it is in organic molecules like cyclopropane and cyclobutane. You can watch bonds bend and see the bond paths bend, these tubes of charge concentration we talked about. You can see them bend when a bond is... Well, when a, when a bond bends, does it make then a sharp negative feature? Well, uh, a covalent bond can... A covalent bond has that negative tube between the atoms. Your two overlapping fingers, that's your thats your tube, your orange tube of charge concentration between the two uh, carbons. And your okay, But when it, when it bends, though, how much does the morphology of the tube change? Does it become sharp in the middle? Like, is it kink? 
or is it a smooth bend? No, it's, just a smooth, it's, a, it's, it's a smooth, it's just like imagine your plastic bonds and organic chemistry model kits. When you bend a bond with a plastic tube, it becomes a smooth arc. That's what happens to the oh. tube. That's okay. exactly what happens to the tube if it's a covalent bond with shared interactions. But so now you have your fingers again in front of you and you can watch the, the your two fingers, the double one, bend as you pull your right elbow down because of somebody is pushing it down and it has it has to go down. The bond of your fingers bends, but that's not the way that's that's a covalent bond. And these metal metal ligand bonds in molecules that have like whatever B12 and this rock carbine, imagine make a fist with your left hand. Your fist has a hole where your index finger and thumb make a circle, a little dent. That is the hole in the Niobium map. Now you make a fist with your right hand and your index finger, the knuckle of your index finger is a lump. That is the carbon atom. Now you stick the, your index finger and your right hand, the knuckle, into the hole on your left hand. And that makes like a little lock in a key kind of bond. Now, so now that's the bond. It's the, the knuckle in the hole of your fist. That's the bond. Now, when you bring your right elbow down, the knuckle just moves in the notch. It doesn't really change. The knuckle of your right hand just changes its orientation to the hole. And that is exactly what I saw happen to the lump on the carbon atom in this truck carbon model when I rocked the, um, the the carbon atom and kept the rest of the molecule fixed. It was, did not expect it, and but it was a epiphany because it's just it's it's like a lock and a key. It's not it's not a shared interaction, which you see for a true covalent bond. What what about at very high temperatures or low temperatures? At high, do you see a lot of oscillation, even if it's a locking key or you know in the bending? Excellent question. Excellent question. And that's one that's one of the questions I got asked in Dallas, actually. Very brilliant member of the audience who an educated, intelligent question for every speaker, virtually every speaker, from everything from electron diffraction to microwave spectroscopy to I mean, he was just he was a polymath. And that's a question he asked me. So the answer is most quantum mechanical calculations are simulating zero Kelvin uh, because the atoms are fixed in position when we're doing the calculations. But even at zero Kelvin, quantum mechanically, uh, there are so-called zero point motion. So molecules have a very slight, have, a, have a, a vibrational mode that must exist because of the Heisenberg principle at even zero Kelvin. And that's when close below 20 degrees Kelvin, which is very, very cold, minus 250 degrees Celsius, like minus 400 and something Fahrenheit, uh, that's when the really, really excellent experiments are done, when chemists have like X-ray vision to probe the cloud, the electron clouds and molecules to get as little vibrational motion as possible when they're studying these clouds. Now, when you heat it up, heat a crystal up or heat a molecule up, more more vibrations occur. And but you can study these with computers. You just you just make them make the molecules a position of the atoms change, and you recalculate the cloud density and people have done this and parts of the cloud the cloud cloud naturally changes its value the values change but the topology the topology of the cloud does not change in any examples that i've seen for um for simple vibrational motions up to reasonable temperatures now if you have extreme motions of the of the atoms displacements of the atoms those correspond to reactions and then you do see that the uh, topological properties change. So, but that can all be explored with quantum mechanical software. But it's a, it's a good you question. Um, Go ahead. Uh, do you, well, I was thinking about gases versus liquids versus solids. Are you able with your computer modeling to model the the very edge of a solid or the surface of a liquid? Yeah, that's an excellent question. The answer is, if you have a solid, then yeah, which has, yes, you can. You can do a calculation on basically a repeating a, trend, uh, a repeating unit in itself. So you imagine having atoms arranged in a close pack arrangement. Imagine that pattern extending off to infinity. So computers can model that, that repeating pattern very easily. It's when you have a pattern that doesn't repeat and goes on long distance, that is when it gets challenging computer-wise, computationally. But if it's a repeating pattern, like a single crystal, 
So if every atom is essentially the same on the surface of the crystal, then you can model that very accurately. And people have done that and looked at the lumps and the holes and it's very insightful. And in fact, um, one of the talks at, that I went to in Dallas, the conference in Dallas on the Austin Symposium, it was a group from Italy looking at electron cloud in crystals of uranium compounds. They were seeing the lumps and the holes that I was just talking about around the uranium atom, which and has many more lumps than you typically see in organic compounds because uranium has has many electrons, valence electrons in its inner shells, uh, including F electrons and D electrons. So it was fascinating. It was I was just enthralled watching watching talk from the group from Turin, and it just blew my mind. That's everything. Yeah, with uh, with substances like uranium that have a lot of internal, you know, electrons, yeah. do they lay upon each other and deform each other? Will you get a different surface yes. if you're looking at a, I don't know, a, you know, yes, and it's orbital or orbital, but it has five orbitals below it. Yes, yeah, the, the onions of an of an onion I mentioned before, in a in a carbon atom or a silicon atom, the inner level layers of the onion were uninteresting. Okay? They were chemically inert. But in uranium, it's not it's not that simple. The outer layer and the layer below it, and even maybe the layer below it. So the two or three outer layers of the onion are all chemically relevant. It's not until you get to the really inner ones where, like I was traveling near the speed of light, where they become still interesting, but chemically inert. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a very little explored area of the periodic table by any theoretical tools really at an accurate level. So I'm very excited, potential collaboration with these people. And they also, the, the experiments yeah. are actually done in Detroit. They do the computer modeling in Durham. I mean, you're not going to see this in nature, but a, a lone nitrogen atom versus N2. Have you, have you been able to impute what a lone N atom, you know, nitrogen atom would look like? And what does N2 look like, for instance, or H2? Well, you're talking about N2 or, I mean, if you're talking about- Well, let's, let's say, yeah, let's say nitrogen. So again, in nature, we're not going to see nitrogen alone, but we do see N2 all over the place. So what do the two look like? And can you impute one from the other? You can find in space, in nitrogen atoms, isolated nitrogen atoms. Uh, oh, okay. You can create them in the lab too. But if you were to look at the charge distribution it would, for an isolated atom, it'd be spherical because there's no, there's nothing breaking the symmetry. So if you take a, the nitrogen atom and you look at it, you use the X-ray vision tool I'm talking about, you would see an orange beach ball with a little white, kind of a blue moat inside where you have the, the gulch between the core and the valence. And at the core, where the nu nitrogen nucleus is, you'd see a, a, a white golf ball because white is very hot color, so that's, that's a concentration. So you'd see a, a white golf ball, blue moat, and then an orange beach ball. And a faint green haze going out to infinity. Now, when that approach, when two of these things approach one another, the orange beach balls will start to deform. And certainly, I just had the picture of mitosis. If you see the spindles during mitosis come together, they line up. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of what it would look like, but it'd be more spherical between the atoms to make the orange cylinder between them. That's the triple bond. But at the same time, you would see another orange lump forming on the exterior sides of both atoms because nitrogen has five valence electrons. Each nitrogen atom has five valence electrons. So three atoms on each would form a co would share with three atoms on the other. So you form a triple bond. Take your finger, take your right left hand finger hands again, make a three with your left hand and the three with your right hand. So you got three fingers sticking out of your fist, bring them together and you make a triple bond. You make the three, the two triangular pyramids touch up and that's, that's a triple bond. But nitrogen has five valence electrons. So on the back side of your hand, there is a two more electrons. And I only have five fingers and I can't, my other fingers are not ambidextrous. I'd break my fingers if I stuck them out of the other direction. But the back of your hand and nitrogen would have a big bulbous orange lump. That would be the lone pair on each nitrogen atom. So that's what you'd see up. You can see it all with, you know, on your, on your PC with computational chemistry software. What about uh, noble gases? What do they look like? Just spheres? Yes, they're just spheres when they're isolated. When I did a study on noble gases do form bonds, krypton and xenon. Argon does, but it's very, very, um, it's not, not seen in a lot of experience. Most of the Bach compounds to argon are formed with their fleeting molecules. They're formed in the gas phase and they don't, they, they react very quickly. But compounds with krypton and xenon can be 
formed and, and growth crystals up. And chemists using the X-ray diffraction, using the X-ray vision, you can look at the lumps and the holes in these atoms. And so I looked at, using my computer, the guy across the hall when I was doing my PhD studies, he, he and his students explored these compounds in the lab. Krypton and xenon compounds. Now, krypton and xenon like to be gas. They are, after all, called noble gases. Uh, so when you make crystals of them, they're not very happy, and they can very easily become gases. And when a crystal becomes a gas instantaneously, that's yeah, it goes boom. And so everyone, they always do their reactions on a very small scale. And every once in a while, you you hear a, a boom from across the hall, and we had come out and see what reactions they were doing. All done very safely. Nobody would ever very often wear shields when they're doing these reactions inside, on top of the fumes they were doing inside. So I was doing the computer modeling to model these compounds that they were making. And so again, let's say krypton. In an isolated atom, it would be a beach ball. Just like I talked about the nitrogen atom, nitrogen atom before, but it's bigger now because it rolled down the periodic table. Actually, two rows down the left periodic table from nitrogen. So it would be a big beach ball. And as it forms a bond to fluorine, which very usually, very often does, that beach ball would suddenly become a torus, like a lifesaver that you see in a rally pool. And mm. the krypton atom would be at the center, very close to the center of that torus. And a nitrogen fluorine atom would be the axis that goes to the torus. And it would have um, taken its electron from krypton, and that's what breaks, deforms the beach ball into the lifesaver ring. And we see that same thing happened when we when we reacted xenon with fluorine in the computer. So it's the beach ball becomes a torus. All these, ooh, you don't have the, you know, the floaties, you have the, the torus shape, the donut shape floaty, I forget what they're called. One more thing, the beach ball becomes the inner tube. And the fluorine is on one side of the inner tube, but that leaves a hole on the other side of the inner tube. And the inner tube has, you can, you can fill the hole from both sides, from two sides, because an inner tube, you can put something in from one side or put it from the other side. You know, make a little ring of your finger. You can put something in from one side or you can put it in from the other side. So the krypton and the xenon have these holes and we find that other molecules can stick their lumps into the other hole on the opposite side of the fluorine. And my co my rest of the work across the hall, that's exactly what they find in every crystal. These krypton and xenons, when they do make a covalent bond to fluorine, they always make a bond to the other side of this inner tube with an, a lump from a base, such, such as the nitrogen or typically nitrogen, or it could even be, rarely they, they want to try and make carbon compounds to, xen to noble gases, that's very hard commonly do make it with nitrogen, just like the cobalt ion and uh, yeah. nitrogen. This brings to mind one more question. Um, what, what does an ionized atom look like? Either, you know, plus one, plus two, plus three, whatever you can do. What does it look like under the modeling? Well, for instance, a, a fluorine minus one. Okay, so you, add, you, can, you can make ions by adding electrons or taking electrons away. So if you take a fluorine atom and add an electron, it looks just like a neon atom if you look at, if you look at it. It's hard. You, you you probably couldn't tell the difference. If you take a neon atom and take an electron away to make a neon plus one ion, it will look just like a fluorine atom. So you, you just if it's an atom, you just see the the, the beach balls. The size, the radius of the beach ball might be a little different. It, don't, it will be a little different between a neon plus one ion and a fluorine atom, but not much. But they would look to an untrained eye, they'd look the same. Because yeah, what if you have an heavily ionized atom plus five more? You strip it. You strip all the electrons off. Yeah, then you get down. Then, then, then you get so. down just to the white little gift golf ball. That's it. But again, they, these would be so reactive. A highly ionized atom would would be incredibly reactive oh, as you strip are. away more electrons or give them. They are. So they're what just... what's making it that way? I would think the surface features would be very dramatic. The uh, more you uh, ionize. Uh, good question. It's still it's still an ion, so it's still spherical. You're not going to see surface features. The Coulomb, the electrostatic attraction of the highly positively charged nucleus, well, the ion, which is, if you remove all the valence electrons, you basically have just the core left with a high positive charge. And it's spherical. So it's going to look, it's going to look, uh, the nucleus is always going to look white, white hot, because the curvature at the nucleus of any ion or any atom is, the curvature is very negative. So it's got, if you, hot colors are for the negative curvatures, the nucleus and the core always look white. Now, you, I did talk about that moat between the, so separates the core and the valence regions, sort of a quantum mechanical Neverland. 
That's why you know, atoms have, have quantized energy levels between the core and the valence. That's, that's what quantum catch is all about, quantized energy levels. So there is this region of space between the core shell of the atom and the valence shell. Now, if you take the whole valence shell away, you still have blue moat. It would be blue, but it'd be featureless. It'd be spherical. But blue means there's a hole. So it would be basically not a black hole, but a blue hole that would suck in electrons from any atoms that came there, any atoms or molecules that came there. Because a, a nitrogen plus five ion is not going to hang around around in water or any kind of organic matter. It's going to take electrons from whatever comes in here. But it would be a blue hole, not a black, but a blue hole, and suck electrons into it to create a new valence shell. You start to see the orange shell reappear as you added electrons to it. I've never done it, but that's what, that's what I imagine would happen. How did you first figure this out? How did you, did you invent this or who did and how was it like okay. What was it like in the very beginning? I was a graduate student in a McMaster University in Richard Bader's lab. He's a professor of chemistry there, now deceased, but he pioneered what's called the quantum theory of atoms and molecules, where he studied the topology of the total charge density. And as I mentioned before, it looks kind of boring. You just have the peak at the nucleus and all the nuclei. And, but he found out that there were these saddles or ridges between all the atoms that chemists thought were bonded to one another, but not, you didn't find the ridges between at, atoms that chemists did not consider being bonded to one another. So he developed a whole quantum theory of molecular structure based on the topology of the total charge density. And one of the important factors that they studied was the Laplacian. They didn't think of the Laplacian as the lumpiness. To them, the Laplacian, to the group, the Laplacian was a what, what they call the Lagrangian density, which would essentially is a difference bet between two ways of defining the local kinetic energy in a quantum mechanical system. There's two ways to do it, so-called Schrodinger method and the Heisenberg method. There are two different ways of defining local kinetic energy, which cannot be defined unambiguously by Heisenberg uncertainty principle or an electron. So the difference between those was proportional to the Lagrangian density, which is just proportional to the curvature of the density, which is what I, I said, well, if it's a curvature, we can start thinking about atoms as having features. And the rest went from that. We just started connecting the features that we saw in the calculations to the things that all chemists are taught when they take courses on electron, uh, for instance, a valence shell electron pair repulsion model. Every freshman chemistry student learns about the VSEPR model, about lone pairs and bonded pairs and how they interact with one another from the shape of a molecule or the reactivity of a molecule. And that model was invented by another professor at McMaster University, Ron Gillespie, who's now also deceased. So the two professors happened to both be my professors, and um, I was doing research with one and being taught by the other, and uh, it just sort of clicked when uh, I realized that the Lagrangian density was just the curvature of the density. And that was, I was like, I said, 40 years ago. So what are some generally applicable principles that you garnered from looking at all this modeling and doing all this modeling? What's, you know, how does this change how chemistry has done for you and for everyone else? Well, it hasn't changed how chemistry has done for other people. There have been some people following theor theoretically, but it's still waiting for, you know, uh, a viral moment, let's say, when it, everybody realized this is probably one way that is grounded in reality to understand reactiv reactivities of, of molecules. But the question, I think, is it's going to help people understand why molecules prefer to react to certain, certain directions and how that can be when you block that direction, that can affect the reactivity of the molecule. So basically, I like to call it picotechnology. I think I mentioned it before. And this is just a rebranding of the research, but a picometer is about 100 the, the size of the radius of, of atoms, plus, plus or minus, you know, depending on the atom. So when I was talking about these features, these orange tubes or these orange lumps, those are things that measure tens of picometers in diameter or length. They're subatomic features. And so nanotechnology is the study of the structure of molecules and large molecules and how to interact with other molecules to make structs, functional structures. That's nanotechnology, basically supermolecular chemistry. A femtometer is a thousandth of picometer. So now you're talking about the radii of nuclei. Nuclei have radii measured in, in femtometers. 
10 to the minus 15 meters. So nuclear physics is, if you want to think of it, is really femtotechnology. And so picotechnology is what I'm talking about. It's the it's the subatomic features, the lumps and the holes, and atoms that are in molecules. And it, these lumps and holes, the directions of them, the sizes of them, they are largely was determining the chemical reactive reactivity of those atoms. So picotechnology is um, a way to engineer properties of atoms to make them do the kinds of chemistry that chemists want. That, that's the most general thing I could say. But I like the word picotechnology. And in fact, if this, if this podcast is going to have a title, it should be, what is picotechnology? Hmm. Can, can, are you able to model a series of reactants well enough so you can tell if they would if they would bond and what kind of uh, molecules they would form? Is that yeah. possible? There have been a couple of Nobel Prizes in chemistry awarded for the for the tools to do that for last say the last 20, 30 years, it's gotten that good. So yeah, chem quantum chemists can do this and been doing it for, for decades. Well, what would be the uh the moonshots, the amazing things to be able to understand with this modeling that maybe you can't get with your approaching? Hmm. Okay, that's a good question. And as I press the news like a billion dollars from your lab, what do you think you could figure out in the next couple of years? Well, I you know, um there's the opportunities are literally limitless. Um, as limitless as chemistry. So, um, you know, questions that, that I've been th thinking about right now with all the uh, mRNA vaccine technology is trying to, trying to understand at a subatomic level how to make DNA and RNA molecules react the way you want them to. And so that's, that, that's sort of what I'm working on now right now with my students is trying to understand the differences in the, the lumps and the holes and RNA versus DNA and trying to understand that chemistry, structural chemistry, a little bit better. It's, it's fascinating. DNA is one of the most amazing molecules in the, in the universe. I mean, the more I learn about DNA, the more, more it amazes me. Any surface features that you want to comment on on DNA? What makes it so crazy? All you do is you remove one oxygen atom and ribose to make deoxyribose to make DNA. And that removing that one oxygen changes, has a, a like a, like a Rube Goldberg effect, a ripple effect on the rest of the geometry, the shape of the ribose molecule that is in the RNA or the DNA chain. And this has profound differences on the, the macromolecular structure of RNA versus DNA. DNA can form a double helix very easily, naturally does. And, but RNA does not. It does other amazing things, really amazing things. But DNA forms a double helix. And I think it's because of subatomic features of the carbon atom that has lost its oxygen atom. It changes the lumps and the holes in that one carbon atom, and there are ripple effects that affect all of life, really. I mean, it's, that's one thing. I got an undergraduate student working on that right now. But it fascinates me. DNA is an amazing molecule. I just can't take my mind off of it. Well, very good, Preston. If you wouldn't mind just give listeners uh, an idea where they can find out more, and maybe there's a, uh, a free version of the model or a paid version they could use on their own computers. Like, where can they go to find out more? Well, I'll put some, I'll send you some PDF files of manuscripts that have a good overview. There are software programs that do all the things I talked about. Mostly they're available at most universities already, but they're they're not that expensive for private licenses. And there's some that are on, on the web, but they're not, I think it's called, I forget what it's called, WebMO maybe, but uh, mm -hmm. don't quote me on that. But there are some online features where you can do small quantum mechanical calculations, generate like charge cloud, and then use OpenGL software to basically to, to graphically explore the, the charge cloud. The program that I wrote with NASA and is all done with OpenGL software, so nothing proprietary. And it's just looking at the, the local curvature of the charge density cloud that you get from a quantum mechanical calculation. Okay. And hopefully that'll give some people a bit of a lead. But the, the papers are interesting to read and they have a lot of references inside. Well, great. Well, Preston, thank you again for coming back. Uh, it's always really fascinating to talk to you. I think this is like a really amazing area of uh, of science and chemistry that is just going to, I don't know what it's going to do, but I think it's going to be really impactful on how chemistry is, is done and predicted, et cetera. So thank you again for coming. Thank you for having me and for asking such great questions. You always do. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.